eternal life to be on earth. If you were to talk to many people out there on the street, in actual fact I'd say if you were to talk to all people out there on the street, they would tell you that their promise is to go to heaven. But the Bible knows nothing of that. Throughout scripture, from one end of the scripture to the other, faithful men look for that time when eternal life would be on this earth. When the kingdom of God would be established on this earth and faithful men and women would inherit it. To get this wrong is to get your eternal destiny wrong. God has made promises to man and those are the things that God will, God will fulfil. As we said, most religions, in actual fact all religions, have a reward after death. Most of them tell you you're going to heaven. But the sad thing is the Bible knows nothing of it. But it clearly and consistently shows that the reward of man is to be on the earth. And it's what man has looked forward to from the time of Adam and Eve. Because of your attendance here this evening, we assume that you hold the Bible as the inspired word of God. And it's to the words of the Bible that we will turn this evening to look at this subject. To show the promise that God made to Abram, whose name was changed to Abraham, and how that can affect us. We're introduced to Abraham in Genesis chapter 11, verse 27 to 32. If you'll turn back a page, we'll read that. We read in verse 27 of Genesis chapter 11. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took... Them wives, the name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren, she had no children, no child. And Terah took Abraham, Abram his son, and Lot his, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai his daughter in law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came into Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were two hundred and five years, and Terah died. So we're introduced here to the man called Abram, and to his descendants and those who were around him. And we find this man Abram, whose name was later changed to Abraham, became known as a friend of God. Abram left Ur of the Chaldees and came to a place called Haran and dwelt there until Terah died at the age of 205. In Genesis 12, the words that God had spoken to Abram prior to leaving Ur are recorded. And it's based on these words that Abram left Ur of the Chaldees to travel to a land that God would show him to a place that he did not know of. But he put his faith in God and went there. Now you might ask, why do we need to understand a promise that was given nearly 4,000 years ago? Well, if you'll t keep your hand in Genesis, but if you'll turn over to Ephesians 2 and verse 12, we have the reason. Ephesians 2 and verse 12. And the Apostle Paul, talking to the believers at Ephesus, says at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So he was telling these people here that they didn't understand the promises. They were outside the commonwealth of Israel and because of those things, they had no hope in the world that they lived in. And for those who don't understand these promises, they fall into the same category. So we find that Abram left Ur of the Chaldees 
And he travelled from Ur. He went to Haran and eventually down into the land of Israel. The red line is where he went. Walking all that way to a land that God would show him. In Genesis 12, verse 1 to 3, we have the words that had been spoken to him in, in Ur. We read, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So God had told Abram to leave his, the country of his birth and to go to a land that God would show him. And if Abram did this, the promise in verses 1 to 3 of Genesis 12 would be his. Abram went, not knowing where he was to go. In obedience, he, followed, he did as Almighty God had told him. A long track, if you have to walk it. In Hebrews 11, verse 8, the chapter of the faithful, we're told that by faith, Abram, Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. So we find that Abram left Ur of the Chaldees, and he travelled to Haran. And it appears that he stayed there for a period of time until Terah, his father, died in Haran. And then he went on to the land as God had showed him. From this point on in Abram's life, from various faithful things that Abram did, God gave him a progression of promises. We're going to have a quick look at them and then see how they impact on us. In Genesis 12 and verse 7, we read, And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So on arrival in the land that God had told him he would show him of, when he arrived there, God made another promise to him, a promise that it would be given to one who was of the seed of Abraham. Verse 1 to 3, it would appear, was told to him when he was in Ur. And verse 7, when he arrived in the land where God had told him. He was promised that one of his descendants, or a descendant of Abraham, would inherit the land forever. Unto thy seed will I give this land. If we turn over to Genesis chapter 13 and verse 14 to 17, we have a further promise made to Abram. Genesis 13 verse 14 to 17. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed for ever. And I'll make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise and walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. So Abram at this time was told to look from the place where he was, to look to the four points of the compass, and all the land that he could see, to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west, would be given to Abram and to his seed forever. And just in case there was any doubt, he was told to walk through the land in the length of it and the breadth of it, and this would be given to him. He was told to feel it under his feet. Where wasn't he told to look? He wasn't told to look up. Abraham, Abram or Abraham never had any illusions of going to heaven. God told him he was to inherit the land for, forever. He was not to receive a reward 
in heaven. In Genesis 15, verse 17 to 21, there's a further promise given to Abram. Genesis 15, verse 17 to 21. And it came to pass when the sun went down, and it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant unto Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, Unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenite and the Kenizzite and the Cabmanite and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. They all dwelt in that land. It was described as being an area from the Nile to the river Euphrates. And you get an idea there of the land that was promised to Abraham. The area in green from the Mediterranean Sea to the river Euphrates in the north and down to the river Nile in the south. The 70 nations that got together in the last week to discuss how they were going to divide Israel up have got it sadly wrong. Because that's the land that God has promised to Abram. So Abram or Abraham was promised this land for an inheritance, for, an, in, in, for eternity. There was no promise or no illusions made to Abraham that he would go to heaven. And if we look in Hebrews 11 and verse 13, we see that these all, and Abraham's one of the ones being spoken of, they all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them, and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. These men died, looking forward to that day when God would give them the promise. They lived on the earth as strangers and pilgrims, waiting for God to fulfil that promise. But though they died, they knew that God would raise them to receive the promise. You see in Mark, when the Lord Jesus Christ, Mark 12, when the Lord Jesus Christ was challenged by those who were trying to trip him up in the things he said about the resurrection, he replied and said, For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. But as touching the dead that they rise, have ye not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. You see what? At this time, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob were dead. And when Moses saw the burning bush, they were, he was de they were dead. But the Lord Jesus Christ was saying, he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Yes, God will raise those men from the dead so that they receive the promise he has given to them. And in God's eyes, those men are as good as living, though they have been in the grave for some 4,000 years, because true to his word, he will raise them and they will inherit that land. You see, Abraham was made these promises we looked at. They were, re they were remade to Isaac, the son of Abraham, and also to Jacob, and they all died without receiving that promise. But the promise was that they would inherit it. And they looked for that day when God would raise them from the dead. They were told that they would inherit the land forever. Well, you might say, what has this promise that is 4,000 years old got to do with us today? These men have died. Time has seemingly gone on. How does that relate to us? Well, in the New Testament, in Galatians 3 and verse 16, we're in Galatians 3 and we'll look at parts of it. The Apostle Paul expands so that on these things so that he, we can have a better understanding of them. And in verse 16, he says, Now to Abram, Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed which is Christ. So he's telling them that 
The seed spoken of to Abraham is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we go back to Genesis 13, and if I've got this right here, verse 15, we see where this was made. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. He's speaking of a seed, singular, not as in many. And the Apostle Paul tells us that that one is the Lord Jesus Christ. So Abraham was promised the land forever with his descendant, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we look further down in Galatians 3 and verse 26 to 29, we have a further explanation of this for us. Verse 26, For we are all the children of God by faith in, Je in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In verse 29 we're told, If we be Christ's, then are we Abraham's seed, singular, and heirs according to the promise. And if we look back, we're told to be in Christ, we are to be baptised. And in so doing, we can become part of the seed of Abraham. Those in Christ are all one in Christ, and hence are of the seed of Abraham. And when we look back to the promise to Abraham that was made, he was told that his seed would be as the sand on the seashore and the stars of heaven for multitude. But they are all one in Christ and can inherit that promise. You see, Abraham was promised the earth for eternity. That's the promise that is extended to mankind if they are prepared to listen to the things of Almighty God and to be baptised, as it says here, into Christ and put on Christ. Through scripture, the reward of inheritance on the earth is constantly repeated. In Matthew 5 and verse 5, we're told, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The words of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he gives us the attribute of some of those who will inherit the earth. We're told that they are the meek. Matthew 6, verse 9 to 13. The Lord's Prayer, if you'll turn there, please. Matthew 6, verse 9 to 13. We have the words of the Lord Jesus Christ when he taught his, his disciples to pray. In verse 9, we read... After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Verse 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ was directing his disciples to long for that day when God's will would be done on earth. Not something that has ever happened in the history of mankind on this earth. We know it's not the case. Man goes on pleasing himself. But the disciples were told to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. They were told to look forward to that time when the will of God would be on this earth, from one end of the earth to the other. They were not taught to long for that time when you will go to heaven. Daniel 2, verse 44 and 45. It speaks of this kingdom that will be established on the earth. And for context, in verse 44, in the days of these kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom 
which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God hath made known unto the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. We're told in verse 44 that God will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And it won't be left to other people, but it will break in pieces the kingdoms of this earth and consume all these kingdoms and it will stand forever. You see, the kingdom of Babylon came and went. The Medes and the Persians came and went. The Greek Empire came and went. And finally Rome. An empire that was never overthrown but divided into kingdoms, depicted by the toes. And it was until a stone cut out of the mountain without hands struck that image, grind, ground it to powder and grew and filled the entire earth. The Lord Jesus Christ returning to this earth to establish the kingdom of God. We're told that God will set up a kingdom on the ruins of the kingdoms of men. It's a kingdom that will last forever. The politicians of the world can trump on all they like about making their nation great. But when this occurs, it will be destroyed and the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will last forever, that will truly be great. But he will establish it on earth. That's the important point to remember. Revelation 11 and verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. So the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. A kingdom that he will reign over forever and ever. It's a kingdom, as Daniel described, growing and filling the entire earth. It will fill the earth so that the glory of God fills this earth from, to the total exclusion of all else. And that has been the will of Almighty God from the beginning of creation, that this earth may be filled with his glory as the waters cover the sea. Turn back with me, please, to Psalm 37. And we have in Psalm 37 the words of the psalmist David and where he expected his reward to be. In verse 3 we read, Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. So David said, If you trust in the Lord, you'll dwell in the land. Verse 9, we're told, For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Evildoers, we're told at this time, will be no more. But those who, in, who wait upon the Lord, they will inherit the earth. Verse 11, we read this in Matthew 5 and verse 5, didn't we? The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. We have one of those attributes, as we had in Matthew 5. The meek will inherit the earth. And on this earth in that time, there will be an abundance of peace. Not United Nations style peace. Peace as God will have it on this earth. A oneness with all men. Verse 18. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. Where's that inheritance going to be? Verse 11. The earth. Verse 9. The earth. Verse 22. For such as be blessed of him, those who are blessed of God, shall inherit the earth. 
and those that be cursed of him shall be cut off cut off if you're blessed of god the earth is your inheritance verse 29 the righteous shall inherit the earth and dwell therein forever verse 34 Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. We're told that if we wait on the Lord, if we keep his way, we'll inherit the land. But not only will we inherit the land, we will be there to see when the wicked are cut off. When the wicked are no more. There's no mention in this, is there, of an inheritance of going into heaven. It is all of inheriting the earth forever. The psalmist didn't expect to go to heaven. He expected he would die. He would return to the ground, but that God would raise him to inherit the earth. And he longed for that time when he would inherit the earth for eternity to see the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the psalmist David was told that he would see Christ reign over the kingdom of God on the earth with his own eyes. 2 Samuel 7, if you care to look at that in your own time. If you turn with me, please, to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. We can see that this promise is not extended to everyone. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, we read, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that is found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever. Verse 1 gives us a bit of context as to what will occur in the earth at this time. We're told that it will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And we believe the signs in the world show us that this day is very fast approaching. You don't have to look far to see the troubles, do you? The troubles that this is coming on this world and every side. But when we look at this uh, passage of scripture here, we find there's three classes of people that are in the grave. Verse 1 tells us, or verse 2 tells us that many that sleep in the dust of the earth. It's many, not all. We're being told that not all will inherit eternal life. In scripture, sleep is a way of just referring to death for those who are the believers. It's as a sleep because God will raise them from the dead. He'll raise this, those people who are responsible for judgment. But as the words of this passage indicate, many of those that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. It's not all. Those who are ignorant of things of Almighty God will stay in the grave. They will not be raised to be judged for that which they did not know. Those who do not have the correct understanding of the things of God, who don't understand these things, will not be raised. Those who are not in Christ will remain in the grave for eternity as a general rule. There's a second group we have there. We're told that some will be raised to everlasting life. This refers to those who God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, judges to be worthy of everlasting life and a place in the kingdom. These will be raised and inherit the earth for eternity. These will be given everlasting life and the invitation to live and reign with Christ on this earth. 
To these, their time in the grave will truly be described as a sleep. Because men like Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, David, Daniel, will be taken from the ground to inherit the earth for eternity. To be part of the kingdom of God that he will establish on this earth for eternity. And then we have the third group spoken of there. And some in verse 2, to shame and everlasting contempt. These are those people who are raised and are not judged as being worthy of eternal life. You see, they're those who understood the things of Almighty God, knew what they should have done, but turned their back on them. They will be raised and be judged and return to the earth for eternity. The shame will be that they will be rejected from the kingdom of God and return to the grave for eternity. The same three classes we find exist on the earth when the Lord Jesus Christ returns and the same will occur to these people. Most of us sitting in this hall, possibly all of us, are referred to in this passage of scripture here depending how long it is until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. We told, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. He's telling those believers there, don't sorrow like those in, around you who don't understand the things of Almighty God, because for them their hope is gone when they die. He says, you have a hope. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. In verse 15 we're told that those who are alive at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ will not be taken to be with Christ until those who are dead in Christ are raised. We're given the order in which this will occur. We're told that those who are alive at the, at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ will not prevent or precede those who are dead. In other words, the dead rise first and are taken to be with the Lord Jesus Christ for judgment. And then the believers will be taken also. We're told that it's the believers only, indicating that not all will be taken to be with Christ. Verse 13, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. You see, he's talking to those who understand. In verse 16, the order is given, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17, those who are alive and remain will be caught away to be with the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge these people to determine who will inherit the kingdom of God. To separate, as it was, the sheep from the goats, or the just from the unjust. In verse 18, we're told that those who understand these things, it is to be a comfort to them, because they can look forward to that day when the Lord Jesus Christ will return to establish the kingdom of God on this earth, and those who are in Christ, who are raised, or who are taken at that time, will inherit eternal life. It's a choice each of, a ha each of us have to make today, isn't it? Obedience to God or service to self and the pleasures of sin for a season. One gives toil and limited reward today, then eternal death, while the alter al alternative is obedience to God which will result in an eternal reward. The reward today that is held in heaven 
by Almighty God, which he will bestow on those on the earth who are faithful. Matthew 5, verse 11 to 12. We told, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. You see, what it's telling us is that the life we live today might lead to persecution. But there is a reward waiting in heaven for us when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And that reward is the opportunity to be part of that kingdom that the Lord Jesus Christ will establish on this earth and to receive eternal life. You see, we all have the opportunity to be part of that kingdom. Or we have the opportunity to serve self today and to return to the grave for eternity. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts 1 and verse 11. In actual fact, Acts 1 verse 6 will start. And it's talking about when the Lord Jesus Christ had been raised from the dead and his disciples were there with him. And it says in verse 6, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? You see, those disciples believed that the kingdom of God would be re-established. It would be restored to Israel. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria, and unto the utmost parts of the earth. In verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up from up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So the apostles, the, the disciples that were with the Lord Jesus Christ, said to him, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? His response was, it's not for you to know when that will occur. And in verse 9, we're told that he was received up out of their sight. And you can imagine the disciples looking there, gazing up into heaven where he had gone and thinking, what is happening? Verse 10, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? For this same Jesus which was, taken up, uh, which was taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So he went up into heaven. And those disciples sat there staring, wondering where he'd gone. And these two men, angels, stood there and said, As ye have seen him go into heaven, so will he return. And it's for that day that those disciples longed, and they also have died without receiving the promise, looking forward for that day when the Lord Jesus Christ would return to raise them from the dead. In Mark 16, verse 15 to 16, we have also the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you'll turn there, please. Mark 16, verse 15 to 16. The words of the Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that's what we've been doing this evening, is preaching the gospel. The good news of the glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom that God will establish on this earth with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the king. In verse 16 we're told, He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. There's two options. We can believe the things of the scriptures, the things of almighty God, and be saved, and inherit eternal life on this earth. By contrast, he that believeth not is condemned. 
We saw it in Psalm 37. The wicked shall be cut off. They shall be no more. Ladies and gentlemen, the choice is yours. You can believe those things. Come to an understanding of the things of Almighty God and see the need for baptism. Or you can turn your back on those things and be condemned. We encourage you to investigate the scriptures further. To see the things that Almighty God has planned for this earth. Events that will soon come to pass for your own eternal well-being. We thank you for your time. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is a worldwide collaboration by Christadelphians to help promote the understanding of God's Word to those who are seeking the truth about the human condition and God's plan and purpose with this earth and with mankind upon it. Bible Truth and Prophecy is part of a wider set of online resources provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org for establishing just how far removed the true Christian teaching of the first century apostles is from that taught by mainstream Christendom today. BibleTruthAndProphecy.com is very much a standalone website, but benefits from our vast network of sites and resources and social media. Here are just a few of the things that BibleTruthAndProphecy.com offers. We have a good number of written articles supplied to us from brothers from all over the globe. These deal with first principle issues, creation versus evolution, the inspiration of the Bible, and so much more. We have a whole section of video study series. These are studies that have been posted onto our YouTube channel, but because of the difficulty of the search feature within YouTube, we have chosen to host on Bible Truth and Prophecy. So now, every video you search for within the site, you can be guaranteed that it will be of a Christadelphian nature. We also have a preaching video section, where any ecclesia is invited to download and use or embed these videos within their own ecclesial websites. We also have an exhortation service, where we produce two or three exhortations per week, which we then circulate to brethren and sisters in isolation. We also have an ever-growing list of approved Christadelphian sites. We also have a page of live news feeds, so you can keep up to date with all the breaking news as it happens. We also have a section for the daily readings. Each day at around midnight we publish all three of the daily readings, and then later on in the day we publish Thought for the Days, often based on all three portions of the daily readings. Within each daily reading post, there is also a link to enable you to have the Bible chapter read to you directly. We also feature Bible in the News videos, videos which we have produced from the Bible in the News website. We also feature Brother Don Pierce's Milestone Snippets, which come out approximately three times a week. We also feature Andy Walton's Weekly World Watch, and other commentaries and analysis from other brethren on world news events. You can also subscribe to the blog and be notified of posts as they happen in real time and also subscribe to the weekly newsletter which is provided by ChristadelphianVideo.org. Every page and post on the site has the facility to be able to leave a comment or make an observation so please take advantage of this and let us know what you think of the site.